Yeah, so the title of the whole series is uh, Rigorous Statistics for Academics and Practitioners, and these two sessions, uh, Shapes and Movements of Distributions. At the beginning, I will have some remarks, so some logistics remarks. If you want to sign up for this course series, and if you haven't done that, uh, there is a sign up form. Uh, this is the link right here. So just uh, go to this form, you fill it out, and then you should uh, be receiving an email uh, that will explain how things are organized and uh, it will give you links to all of the different resources. And uh, as for the course related resources, uh, there will be notes. So the notes, uh, it's the kind of thing that you see right here. Uh, the notes are dynamic. Uh, you will be able to expand and collapse different sections. Uh, see pictures and uh, outside links, uh, stuff like that. So you will get an invite to the Acolonia website where the notes will be posted. And uh, then yeah, other, other resources related to the lectures. Well, there will be quizzes and the quizzes are designed in such a way that uh, you're asked a question and uh, then you select an answer. If you select the wrong answer, uh, you will see some explanation of the details, so why this particular answer is wrong, uh, how to think about the problem. Uh, then you go back to the same question and uh, hopefully you choose the correct answer. Uh, there will be homework. Uh, so the homework will be included in the notes. So in one of the first section of the notes, uh, you will be able to see the homework. And uh, yeah, there's also the Mattermost uh, workspace uh, that uh, we can use. So Mattermost is like Slack. And uh, that's something that we can use in addition to the machine learning Tokyo Slack. All right, so if, if you filled out this form, you will be receiving the, uh, the invites for this. And yeah, so uh, in the chat here, I see some uh, questions. Uh, yeah, so the link, uh, yeah, the, the link to the form, yeah, uh, you see it here. And uh, as for the duration of the lectures, it should be something like 45 minutes, uh, but uh, we may go over time. Uh, in addition to this recorded part, there will be a part where uh, you can ask questions without the recording. Uh, then, yeah, one thing that uh, I wanted to mention here is that uh, if you do well, if you understand uh, the content of this uh, lecture series very well, uh, if you convince me that you are hardworking, uh, then I, I should be able to provide uh, connections to different research assistant opportunities. Uh, I often see that uh, faculty members are looking for research assistants. It could be remote research assistants. And uh, if you do that kind of thing, uh, if you do research assistantship and uh, you convince that professor that you are very talented, then they can write recommendation letters for you and you can get uh, to some good uh, graduate program. It can be in all kinds of sciences, uh, maybe quantitative sciences, uh, can be statistics, can be machine learning, can be uh, economics, biology, and so on and so on, engineering, of course. And uh, yeah, besides the research assistant opportunities, I may, I may be even able to connect you to some job opportunities uh, for those of you who are searching for those. Um, all right, uh, so yeah, this uh, the machine learning talk, your Slack channel. Uh, this is in response to one of your questions here. And uh, besides that, we will have this uh, uh, Mattermost uh, workspace. Uh, that we will be able to use as well. Uh, now, uh, this is kind of the beginning of the series, but uh, I should say that uh, previously I gave a four lecture course, again in collaboration with Machine Learning Tokyo and with other meetup groups. And uh, that one was called a Rigorous Introduction to Probability Theory. And uh, well, our current notes, uh, they will contain links uh, to the previous, previous notes and quizzes. And you can also find the videos on YouTube. So if you go to the MIT Artificial Intelligence channel, uh, you will be able to see the four videos in there. And uh, I will be assuming 
in the following lectures that you know the material from these lectures. Uh, I would uh, recommend that you focus especially on the last two. So the last two lectures covered concepts like cumulative distribution functions, probability density functions, uh, probability mass functions, and so on. So something that uh, we need to use every day if we deal with statistics. Uh, now, this, uh, this uh, little course, uh, the four lecture course, was quite technical. So it explained a lot of the fundamentals of probability theory uh, rigorously. Uh, that's mainly in the first two lectures. And uh, going forward, uh, maybe in the next lecture or in the lecture after that, I will be assuming that you are familiar with these uh, basic concepts. So that's just uh, organizational matters. And if there are no questions related to these couple of points, I may want to go forward and uh, discuss the substance here. Yeah, these are actually notes uh, from the prob probability theory course. And here, I just want to highlight that we discuss things like uh, the cumulative distribution function and uh, probability mass function, probability density function, and so on. Um, probably many of you have seen these kind of things. Uh, so for example, this one here would be the binomial distribution uh, corresponding to flipping a coin, maybe an unfair coin a couple of times and counting the number of heads. And here, the blue plot here, uh, signifies uh, the cumulative distribution function. Uh, the red dots, they correspond to the probability mass function. If you are not familiar with these concepts, uh, please follow those videos that are posted on YouTube and related to the previous course on introduction to probability theory. So today I will be assuming that uh, you understand these kind of basic concepts, especially the concepts of probability density function and probability mass function. Maybe I should show a couple of pictures here. So if you have a discretely distributed random variable, uh, then yeah, the probability mass function is what we just saw, the red dots here. If you have a continuously distributed uh, random variable, then you may have a probability density function and uh, here's an example. So uh, here you would see the uh, probability density function and probability uh, and uh, cumulative density, <laughs> sorry, cumulative distribution function of the nor log, nor log normal distribution. Um, I guess uh, people are familiar with the normal distribution. We will be talking about the normal distribution today as well. So here, the Beige curve would represent the probability density function. Uh, it shows where draws from your random variable are likely. And then the blue curve, that's the, uh, uh, yeah, the cumulative uh, distribution function. So that was in the previous stuff. Uh, now let's uh, jump to the topic of today's discussion, really. Uh, today, uh, we should be talking about uh, shapes and uh, moments of distributions. So when I say shape, you probably can imagine what it means, uh, maybe the shape of the probability density function. Uh, when I say moments of distributions, uh, maybe not everybody is familiar with uh, those kind of concepts. So I will define this here. Uh, let me first say that uh, really the moments of distributions, these are going to be some numbers uh, that will characterize the shape uh, of the distribution. Kind of a summary statistic uh, that would capture roughly uh, what, uh, you, what is important about the distribution function. Uh, now there will be a couple of technicalities at the beginning. So I will need to talk about expectations of random variables and uh, I will need to talk about the means and averages, uh, things like that. Uh, once we have gone through the discussion, I will be able to talk about the moments of distributions. Uh, that said, uh, to give you some kind of preview of uh, where we are going today 
and uh, what we should be discussing uh, maybe at a more intuitive level the next time. Uh, let me switch here and show you some particular class of distributions. Uh, yeah, what you see, uh, what you see in this uh, particular visualization is the Johnson's SU distribution uh, that I will show you also in the notes, and I will show you how it's defined here. I'm just using it as a motivation for us. Uh, what we see here is four different concepts uh, that are related to moments of the distribution. So we see the mean, we see the standard deviation, we see the skewness, and uh, we see the kurtosis. If I change the mean, the distribution just moves like this. If I change the parameter sigma in here, uh, then you will see that the thickness of the distribution or of the PDF changes. Uh, then if I change another parameter gamma, it's going to affect uh, especially the skewness of the distribution. And uh, if I change the delta in here, it's going to affect uh, to a large extent the kurtosis of the distribution. So our goal here will be to define all of these concepts and uh, we should talk about why these uh, different concepts are useful, uh, why they're important and uh, how to think about the different shapes of the distributions if someone gives you the values of uh, these different moments. Um, now, if you just uh, start it with probability theory. Uh, maybe the normal distribution is something that you see most often. And uh, I should say that the concepts of uh, skewness and kurtosis, they are very useful in measuring how far the distribution that you are working with actually differs uh, from the normal distribution. So this is where we are going. And uh, now I should actually go into technicalities and uh, I should uh, explain the mathematical definition of all of these terms. So before that, uh, any questions about where we are headed? All right. Okay, it looks like it's clear based on the chat. Awesome. So let's uh, first uh, take a look at expectations. In order to define moments, in order to define these statistics, statistics related or cap capturing the shapes of the distributions, we need expectations. And uh, yeah, here it is. So it will be a lot of different terms to go through. I hope to be able to do that relatively efficiently. First, uh, terminology. So if you hear expectation and uh, if you haven't used this kind of concept in the context of statistics, uh, then you may be surprised what it actually means. So expectation is supposed to be the same thing as expected value. And that's supposed to be the same thing as the mean of the distribution. So basically the average value uh, that your random variable takes. So it's uh, not necessarily people expecting something happening in the future. Uh, it's just uh, this concept, uh, the, the mean of the distribution. Uh, I will define it here in a second. Uh, but uh, let me say that today, uh, the definitions that I will show you, uh, they will not be completely general. I will have one definition for discrete random variables. I will have uh, one definition for continuous random variables. And uh, later on in some of the future lectures, uh, we should have the completely general definition of expectation. So it will be a definition that will utilize uh, measure theory. It will utilize uh, the kind of mathematical apparat uh, apparatus uh, that we built in the previous four lectures that I mentioned earlier. So yeah, later you will actually need to understand uh, the concepts that we defined earlier. Uh, the concept of probability space and, and so on. So please uh, take a look at those lectures. Uh, then, um, yeah, if you have a discrete random variable, it's going to be a random variable that takes some values xi, and uh, you will have either a finite number of them and or you will have a countable amount of them. So, uh, you may have potentially infinitely many values of x, but uh, you should be able to order them 
and uh, you can use some index i uh, to go through this sequence of possible values of x. So in the binomial distribution that I showed you earlier, uh, you would have just a finite number of possible values that x can take. And uh, yeah, in that case, the number of possible values is this nx. Uh, but you can potentially have infinitely many values, uh, say the Poisson distribution uh, will be corresponding to a discrete random variable that can take infinitely many values. So in that case, uh, we would say that this nx in the summation is actually infinity. Um, but yeah, so this could be a finite sum, it could be an infinite sum. And the index i goes over all the possible values that the random variable x can take. So that will be xi and uh, it will be multiplied by the probability that the random variable capital X uh, takes this value xi. So if you compute this sum, uh, then you have computed the expectation of this uh, discrete random variables. Uh, so yeah, any question right now about uh, the notation and uh, the definition? All right, uh, then, if you have a continuous random variable, continuous random variable x, uh, then you may want to work with the probability density function. So the probability density function in here will be p, and uh, you multiply p by x, and you are going to integrate this over uh, all of the real numbers, so from minus infinity to infinity. If you compute this integral, you have computed the expectation of this continuous uh, random variable. And uh, I'm getting a question about the, the nature of p in here. Uh, so uh, yeah, so p is describing the probabilities of the individual values. Uh, for example, if you have the binomial distribution, uh, then you can ask uh, what is the probability that the number of heads uh, that you obtain is equal to zero or equal to one and so on uh, that will be captured by these uh, numbers. And because it's probability, if you sum up all of the possible p's in here, uh, then you should get one. Similarly, if you have a continuous random variable, if you integrate this probability density function over the real line, so from minus infinity to infinity, uh, you should get one. And uh, yeah, of course, a p can never be negative. All right, so one of the comments here uh, says uh, it's like a weighted average. And yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, we are taking the possible values of x in here and we are weighting them by their probabilities. So it is, a, it is a weighted average of the values of x. We are, for the averaging, we are either using this uh, probability mass function or uh, we are using here the probability density function. This intuition is actually pretty useful when we go into the concept of moments. So that's something that we will emphasize there. Okay, so uh, another question here. If nx uh, can be infinity, wouldn't the expected value of x uh, tend to infinity as well? And uh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, also an answer shows up in the chat. Uh, uh, no, because uh, probably these must uh, add to one. So each value is multiplied by a small amount. Exactly, so that, that's the right answer. And uh, let me elaborate on this a little bit because it can be confusing. Yeah, it can be that, say, for the Poisson distribution here, nx is infinity, so you may wonder what's happening to the sum. And I should be able to get you a picture of the Poisson distribution here. Uh, yeah, where is it? Yeah, so here we have the Poisson distribution. Um, the probability mass function is represented here by the red dots. And you see that uh, it's large only for a couple of values, right? So beyond 12 in this particular example, 
uh, the probabilities are quite tiny. And if you go further, uh, it goes to zero fairly rapidly. So even though x will be growing, so the contributions uh, to the sum will contain x in there, even though x will be growing, the probabilities are going to uh, zero pretty quickly. And in the case of the Poisson distribution, uh, you will get just a finite value uh, for the expectation, so for the, for the mean of the distribution. So that's just uh, showing a picture in here related to the discussion. Uh, but uh, it was a really great question because oftentimes these expectations don't exist. So that's my next point. Uh, okay, I think I should uh, catch up on the chat here. Yeah, what is the physical meaning of uh, E in here? Uh, right, so uh, as for E itself, it's just a symbol for us. Uh, so E of X is going to be the expected value of X. And the intuitive meaning is that uh, it's the value of X that uh, you see on average, right? Uh, if you um, create a large, large sample and you calculate the average value of X, uh, chances are that you will be very close to this expected value of X. Actually, another thing that I should mention a little bit later today. Another question, can uh, the expectation of X uh, be a value with a technical probability of zero in the discrete case? Uh, right, right, right. So that's maybe another thing that's a little bit confusing. It may be that you have a variable X uh, that takes two values, uh, maybe minus one and plus one. Maybe you have a coin flip, fair coin, uh, minus one in one case, plus one in the other case. In that case, the expected value is actually zero, uh, but nobody expects zero because uh, zero has, like the, the outcome of zero, uh, the, the value of the variable of zero is impossible. So definitely the expected value of X does not have to be uh, one of those allowed values of X. The, yeah, it's maybe a little bit confusing terminology, but hopefully you get used to it. Uh, it's just mean. The mean can be definitely something that is not realizable as a realization of the random variable. And uh, yeah, so one of the questions was about the existence or the divergence of these uh, sums or integrals. So let me get there. Oh yeah, so another interpretation uh, that you mentioned here in the chat is that um, the meaning could be similar to the center of gravity, like uh, the center of mass, and uh, that's indeed true. So if you calculate the center of mass of a physical body, it will be a very similar formula to what we have here. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to say something about the existence of expectations. And uh, the point basically is that the expectations may not exist. Uh, we will see some rigorous definition of expectations that works for all distributions. And it just uh, is the case that for some distributions, that mathematical object will simply not exist. Uh, what would be an example? Uh, maybe this Cauchy distribution. If uh, you haven't heard of the Cauchy distribution, it is actually a nice looking distribution that has PDF of this particular form right here. I included here a link to Wikipedia so you would be able to see the shape of the distribution. As you see, it's kind of a nice looking distribution. But the thing is, if you try to compute the expectation or if you try to define the expectation of this one, it turns out not to be possible or not to be useful. Uh, so just uh, be aware of that sometimes, sometimes these sums or the integrals, they do not exist. And then we basically say that, uh, say the expectation or the moment of the distribution, if you are talking about that, we say that it just doesn't exist. So that's uh, something quite important. And uh, let me catch up here on the chat.
yeah, so we could have uh, some, some divergence divergence series in here. And uh, yeah, another question, is it like an improper integral? In this particular case, uh, we will have a definition that's uh, very close to the uh, Lebesgue integral. I actually wrote it here. If you define the expectation for a continuous random variable, the meaning of the integral in here is the so-called Lebesgue integral. And uh, we may want to also define the Lebesgue integral in some of our future sessions. It's not the focus right now, uh, but uh, since we will be defining expectations rigorously using measure theory, I may want to include also a discussion of the Lebesgue integral. For some, some functions, simply the Lebesgue integral will not exist. Uh, great, so, so some very good points here. Uh, now, I talked about the uh, expectations of distributions, but uh, I haven't said that much about samples. So let's uh, take a look at that. Uh, if you want to have something analogous to expectation in the case of samples, um, you draw a sample of observations from a particular distribution. Uh, maybe you have sample size n, maybe you name the sample s. You may want to ask uh, what is some analogous quantity that you compute, you could compute. And in this case, uh, the analogous uh, quantity is simply the mean, the sample mean of that variable. So xj in this particular case will be the actual observations in your sample. Uh, you would uh, sum it up over all of the observations that you have, then you divide by the number of observation, observations that your sam that's your sample mean. Actually, a pretty straightforward concept. Uh, but uh, I may want to say a little bit more in here to connect this sample mean uh, to, the, to, the, to the other concepts, uh, to the expe expectations of uh, variables, or, or of distributions. So for that, I have a little bit of manipulation of the exact same quantity in here. So here we are just averaging the actual observations. And uh, to get a different expression for the sample mean, uh, we can use slightly different variables. Uh, notice the difference. Uh, I used parentheses in here around the index of x. In here, I did not use the parentheses. And that's my way of distinguishing observations that you have in your sample and the possible values that X can take. So in this particular case, I'm thinking about a, a, discrete, uh, a discrete random variable X. These uh, Xi, they are going to be the possible values. And uh, this Ni counts how many this possible value Xi shows up in your sample. So if you see some particle xi three times, uh, ni is going to be equal to three. And uh, then the summation would not be over an index that goes over the data set. Instead, uh, you would have a summation using an index that goes over the possible values uh, that uh, x can take. And uh, yeah, sorry, this is actually a mistake in here. Uh, I should be... Oh, no, 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 uh, there's no mistake. Uh, so this is fine. We are dividing here uh, by the total number of observations in the sample. And if you think about it, uh, you can also take this uh, number of times observation i shows up in your sample divided by capital N, and uh, that will be the proportion of observations in your sample that corresponds to this particle value xi. And uh, now the expression looks actually pretty similar to what we had before. Uh, when we defined the expectation of this discrete random variable, we had probabilities in the sum. This time we have sample proportions. So like uh, what percentage of the observations in the sample corresponded to this particular Xi, but otherwise the formula is uh, pretty much the same. So you can say the sample analog of expectation in here is uh, the sample mean and uh, it's defined by this particular formula right here.
Okay, so some uh, questions here. So converting to sample frequencies allows you to generalize to other sample sizes and mix samples. Yeah, that's uh, maybe a good way of uh, thinking about it indeed. So if you had a different sample, maybe 10 times as big, the sample frequencies are probably not going to be terribly different, but of course the individual counts in I, they are going to be quite different. And uh, yeah, so these uh, three lines indeed uh, mean the exact same thing. I just manipulated the original expression to highlight the connection uh, to the expectation that we had for a discrete random variable. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I have some more explanation of the notation, but I already talked about that. And yeah, again, uh, these sample frequencies of the individual observations they are analogous to the uh, probabilities in here. All right, uh, so a couple more things to say here. Uh, this is not just analogous. Uh, there are some rigorous theorems that you can prove uh, relating the sample means and the expectations. Uh, you may have heard about uh, the law of large numbers. So we should go through the law of large numbers sometimes later in some of the future lectures. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, let, let me uh, simply uh, read this out. So the law of large numbers states, law of large numbers uh, states that with certain assumptions satisfied, the sample average converges to the expectation as n goes to infinity. So as you make the sample larger and larger, if uh, the individual observations in the sample are drawn independently from the distribution of this uh, random variable capital X. There are different forms of this law of large numbers and we should discuss that. Uh, but for now, I just wanted to mention this here for context. If you want to think intuitively about the expectation, you can say it's going to be close to the sample mean if you collect a very, very large sample of uh, independent draws from the distribution. All right, so this is uh, some, some background. Oh yeah, more background actually, uh, terminology. Uh, we talked about samples. Uh, sometimes uh, we would use the term population. And uh, in this particular case, like in our context here, uh, the term population uh, would mean the actual distribution that we are dealing with. So this kind of usage of the term population is uh, uh, kind of used often in social sciences. So if we make a distinction between sample and population, uh, we mean a distinction between sample and the underlying distribution of the variable x. All right, so I think uh, I should uh, go here and go through some of the defining relationships uh, that will define the moments. But uh, there will be a lot of things. So a lot of the discussion will have to wait until the next week. All right, so uh, one more question here in the chat. Uh, is the law of large numbers related to the central limit theorem? And uh, yeah, it is, it is. So uh, the central limit theorem would tell you that under certain assumptions, um, kind of the statistics that you compute uh, based on your distribution uh, will approximately follow uh, the normal distribution. And uh, yeah, the central limit theorem it's going to also specify the mean of that normal distribution. And that's definitely related to the law of large numbers. Uh, we will discuss all of these separately, the law of large numbers, the central limit theorem and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, today I will uh, just attempt to define the different moments. Uh, we should think deeply about the meaning of the different moments of distributions uh, the next time. Uh, okay, so one more question. What is the literal significance of the law of large numbers? Um, well, it's simply a statement uh, that uh, if you collect a very large sample of uh, independent observations, 
then as you grow this particular sample, the sample mean is going to approach the actual expectation of the variable x. So something that we will cover in future meetings. All right, so it was supposed to be about moments. Uh, let me define at least a couple of them right now. I have some general formula in here for moments of distributions. I try to make the notation quite consistent with Wikipedia. So if you take a look at Wikipedia, hopefully um, the notation will be clear. But uh, yeah, so right now, this is a formula for a moment of distribution. Uh, after that, I should definitely discuss the examples and uh, explain that this is actually not something terribly complicated. Uh, but uh, now let me just uh, read this. Uh, if you have the nth moment of uh, the of the distribution of x about value uh, c, then what you are calculating is the following. You take the random variable, you subtract uh, the c that somebody decided for you, or you can decide on the value of c. You raise it to the power of n, and then you calculate the expectation. So, so this will be the nth moment about the value c. If uh, it's in the case of discrete random variables, it's the following. You take uh, the possible values of x, you subtract c, you raise it to the power of n, you multiply by the probabilities of xi, and you sum it all up. In the case of continuous distributions, uh, in the case of continuous random variables, you would do something similar. So again, x minus c to the power of n multiplied this time by the probability density function, and uh, it's all integrated in here. Uh, now, at this moment, it may not be entirely clear why we are doing this, uh, but uh, let's, let's take a look at individual examples. Although, yeah, maybe before that, let me also say that one way of thinking about this is that you have a derived a random variable y, so it's just uh, x minus c to the power of n, and you are calculating the expectation of that. And uh, yeah, before I go to the individual cases, let me also say that in the case of samples, you can have something quite similar. Again, x minus c to the power of n, and this time averaged over the sample. Uh, yeah, uh, can you draw a diagram? Well, so I have here a picture uh, simply of this function x. So for the moment, uh, like for a second, uh, let's uh, think about let's uh, think about so-called row moments. So row moment would have c equal to zero. So in that case, uh, what you are doing is you just take x and you raise it to the power of n, and then you take the expectation of that. Uh, I have a picture somewhere. Oh yeah, here. So this is uh, the, a picture of the different powers of x that uh, you may want to consider. And uh, let's uh, think about that in the context of the weighted averages. And uh, yeah, so one more comment uh, relates uh, the, the concepts of moments here to moments in physics. And indeed, uh, it's very closely related to moments in physics. Now, if you think about uh, just the power functions, so x to the power of n for different values of n, these are the possible shapes that are most frequently used. And specifically, if n is equal to 1, you just get a linear function in here. And uh, you would be computing just the basic expectation of uh, x in this particular case. You can say that you have the blue function in here and you use weights that correspond to the probabilities of uh, individual values in here. And uh, yeah, so the expectation that's going to be the weighted average of uh, this uh, blue curve uh, when for the weights you use the probabilities. Uh, then you can have a quadratic function, right? So, so x to the power of 2, that will be the parabola in here, the beige curve, 
And uh, you see that it's uh, growing quite rapidly for high values of x. So in this case, you are computing a weighted average of this uh, Bayes curve. And because the value of that function here is uh, quite high, the values of uh, the values of x that are quite far from zero are going to contribute to that uh, integral or sum uh, quite heavily. And then if you go to higher powers, uh, you will see the green curve here or the orange one, and those grow even faster than that. So if you decide to compute these high moments, so if you decide to compute moments where n is quite big, the contributions from quite extreme values of x are going to be uh, very, very important. Uh, whereas if you compute the low, low value, like uh, low moments, uh, they will not be so heavily dependent on the situations where x is very, very large. All right, uh, I think uh, I should uh, just mention here a couple of definitions. There's a lot to be said, uh, especially the intuition. So let's uh, leave that for the next time. But uh, just to be clear, uh, let me specify some definitions and let's talk about the intuition the next time. So we talked about the row moments. Uh, we can also discuss central moments. So central moment would correspond to choosing C equal to uh, the mu, which is the expectation of X in this case. Um, yeah, we may want to think about the row moment where n is equal to 1. I already mentioned that. That's just the plain expectation of x. Uh, we can talk about the central moment when n is equal to 2, and this is the so-called variance. Uh, probably many of you have heard of variance. And yeah, it's the expectation of x minus mu to the power of 2, often denoted sigma squared. We have an alternative formula here. I think I should uh, discuss the derivation the next time. So this is uh, the first moment, second moment. And uh, a lot of the discussion the next time will be about higher moments. And uh, specifically, uh, we will talk about uh, skewness and uh, we will talk about kurtosis. So the skewness, it's... Uh, a third moment, it is a central moment, uh, so C in here is equal to mu. And uh, I should also say that there's some normalization in here. So we would take uh, the, like the, the ordinary moment, uh, the third moment in here, and we would divide it by uh, sigma cubed. I should say that sigma is the standard deviation or uh, you can think of it as the square root of the variance. So this will be the skewness. And uh, we will also discuss kurtosis, which is this fourth moment, um, n equal to 4. It's uh, a central moment, so c is equal to mu. And it's again normalized. I will explain the next time why we want this normalization. But uh, yeah, so it's this uh, fourth moment divided by sigma to the fourth power. So that's a variance squared. Uh, that's a kurtosis. Um, okay, let, let me see the chat. Uh, yeah, about the notes. Uh, so if you sign up using the registration form, I will send you also information about the notes. Uh, I will send you a link to the notes when they have been posted. Uh, and uh, I will include much of the discussion that we had today. Uh, but of course, uh, we should talk a lot about these uh, different uh, thing, things the next time. And uh, yeah, there's a question about uh, why for higher moments, high values of X are going to play a larger role. And yeah, maybe more precisely, high values of X minus C are going to play a role. And yeah, I try to explain this using this uh, plot, but uh, think about it in a simple way. Let's say n is equal to 3 and uh, x is equal to 10. So then x to the power of 3, that's 1000. That, that's a very big number, right? 
Uh, whereas uh, if you had n equal to one, then you would have just uh, x to the power of one. Then in this case, um, that's a number that is not so huge. And uh, yeah, so why these powers? Uh, it's simply because they show up in the definition of the moments. Yeah, it's uh, the exact same power function in here. Uh, we will talk about the intuition a lot uh, the next time. Uh, but uh, yeah, going back to the visualization that I will be using the next time. If you decide to change uh, mean in this particular case, I can do it very easily. So I shift the distribution in here. If you decide to change primarily the standard deviation, it will correspond to these kind of changes. If you decide to change especially the skewness of the function, yeah, the function, the, the probability density function becomes more and more lopsided in one way or another. And if you decide to change this uh, other parameter, it will affect cortosis a lot. And it's in this particular case, kind of a symmetric change, um, not really affecting the lopsidedness of the function but uh, affecting maybe the tails of the function, how quickly the probability density function approaches to zero as you go to extreme values. Uh, okay, so uh, another question here. Variance and cortosis seem to have similar effect. Uh, why have both? Well, we will see it the next time. Uh, I will provide examples. I will uh, show you some real world distributions and uh, we should talk about that. Uh, but uh, let me say that the standard deviation or the variance, it is uh, kind of related to the overall thickness of this function here. But uh, when we talk about cortosis, it's uh, influenced much more by these high values of X. So like high positive value of X, high negative value of X. And uh, yeah, let, let me change this here. Right, so in this particular case, we have some thickness of this function. I can manipulate the thickness, right? But even if I make the thickness large, the function still approaches zero quite quickly for large values of x. Whereas uh, if I manipulate the cortosis, um, even if I make the function relatively thin for large uh, value of cortosis, you will see that the that quite extreme values of x are quite likely. So that will be part of the discussion the next time. Yeah, think, thanks for the question. And uh, another question, I, I think uh, maybe this should be the, the last one uh, to answer before we stop the recording. Uh, when do data scientists or researchers uh, think about uh, moments in data analysis, for example, let me give you just one example. Uh, let's say that you want to do some hypothesis testing. Uh, you want to create a statistical test of uh, whether or not some effect is real. So you want to get an indication whether your findings, maybe from a lab or from some public data set or from some other data set, whether, whether some finding that you found is real or if it's simply because of some statistical fluke, uh, maybe something random happened in your data set for this particular observation, uh, for this particular data set. And uh, you want to test whether this is a real, whether you should expect the same pattern to also show up in future data sets, or if it's just a one-time thing that happened for random reasons. Uh, you can build these statistical tests and the simplest statistical tests, they are based on the normal distribution. So the normal distribution would have, say, very small cortosis. It would have cortosis close to three. And uh, in that case, very extreme events are very, very unlikely. But if the true distribution that's, re that's uh, responsible for your data has a high cortosis, then quite extreme events happen fairly often. And uh, in that case, your statistical, statistical test 
that is based on the normal distribution may be completely, completely wrong and uh, misleading. So that's uh, one example. Another example could be, say, portfolio analysis. Uh, you, you want to invest in some financial assets. And uh, in that case, how much money you should invest should definitely be related here uh, to the skewness and kurtosis. Uh, you would uh, actually have a pretty bad financial performance if you neglected this, these higher moments. So these are just two examples. It basically shows up anywhere. Anywhere where the shape of the distribution matters, uh, you should be also thinking about these moments. These are some quick concepts that allow you to communicate something about the nature of the shape of the distribution. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for the question. A lot of things are remaining for the next uh, time, right? And uh, the next time, I will remind you of these definitions. Uh, I will try to make sure that everyone is very familiar uh, with the intuition behind the, uh, behind the definitions. And yeah, then let's uh, discuss some real world examples of some uh, real world data where skewness and kurtosis is important in addition to the mean and standard deviation. All right, uh, so I hope to see you the next time. Uh, thanks a lot for joining.